Good morning, everyone, and welcome to church today. Today we get another opportunity to praise and to worship our God, our God who is with us, our God who is good, our God who is the maker of heavens and earth. We begin our service today with a call to worship with these words from Psalm 103. Praise the Lord, my soul. All my inmost being, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love. Let us pray. So Lord Jesus, we come together this morning in all our different places to praise you we join in with the psalmist praising you for the many reasons we have for joy in our heart and thanksgiving in our souls all of our beings praise you for you are good you have done great and wondrous things you care for us you heal us you provide for us you abound in love towards us and we, Lord, want to acknowledge and give thanks to that goodness and to that wonderful love. And so, friends, in this next time of silence, I want you in your homes to lift up your reasons to praise God, your reasons to give thanks to Him. So, Lord, we are trying not to forget all the benefits we have because of you. We praise you for all these things you have done. We are thankful, Lord Jesus, and pray that you would speak into our lives now, that you would draw us ever nearer to you as we listen to your word and as we let it soak into our souls. Bless this time of worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, today is week two of our sermon series, He's Still Got the Whole World in His Hands. Last week, we looked at how this is nothing new, how the uncertainty and chaos that we so often find ourselves in on this planet is something that has been experienced over and over again by human beings. This week, we look at what we can do when times are uncertain, when we feel afraid, when things aren't as we want them to be. So what we remember today, that when life is uncertain, God is not. He's still got the whole world in his hands. And we can pray until the peace of God comes and settles us down. But you know, we acknowledge that uncertainty 
somehow seems to be God's favorite environment in which to do his work in our lives. It seems that that's the way he gets the most accomplished in human beings. You know, it is the chaos or the uncertainty that wakes us up to the fact that we need something more than ourselves and our own strength. It causes us to look for God and to cling on to that which is bigger than us. But you know, uncertainty also has a great way of grabbing an entire nation's attention, turning the hearts of all people towards God. It's when people go back to prayer. It's when people collectively repent of their sins. It's when values are reshuffled. It's when things are reset to a better and healthier way of living. Uncertainty is nothing new in this world, and often, Uncertainty is the place where God does his best work. I want to ask you a question this morning. How many of you have gotten closer to God or have returned to God or have renewed your commitment to him on the back of a time of crisis or difficulty or uncertainty? How has this COVID-19 pandemic affected your relationship with God? Because for many of us, it has made us stop and think about how we have been living, think about our faith, and put some renewed effort into connecting with this God, this being who can truly help us when we reach the end of our ability to do anything. Most of the Bible is written in times of uncertainty by people who are facing extraordinary challenges. You know, the Bible is not filled with feel-good messages that have no relevance to the chaotic, fearful, worrying world that we live in. We find God speaking directly into uncertain times all throughout the Scripture, which is why the Bible is the perfect place for us to dive into in our own times of chaos, of panic, of worry, of uncertainty. We are in good company when we feel as though we are in scary times and deep waters. This is what the Bible gives us lots of information on. But this is also how God has always worked in people's lives. The Bible isn't just a book about people having fun. It's about people wrestling with challenges, wrestling with faith trying to hang on to God and to hope, and some way, somehow, finding a way through it all because of God's goodness and because of the peace that God ultimately brings. The Bible reminds us that in all these times of chaos and problems and issues, it is God who is the one who is truly dependable. God is the one we can reach out to for help. God is the one we can cling to in times of desperation. But I think where the problem comes in for us Christians is that in these biblical stories and in our own experiences of life, it seems as though although God might be in control and might even be up to something, it just seems too passive or too slow or too removed from the immediacy or the urgency of the help we need. God, we want help. This crisis is big and we want help now. Lord, I want you to end this coronavirus pandemic now. I want this all to be over. I want things to go back to normal. Lord, I want you to heal me now. I want you to change the circumstance instantly. God seems too passive and it seems as though he takes too long. We don't like that feeling of being vulnerable or out of our depth or not sure about when that help is going to come or when that answer will arrive. We struggle to wait for God to do it His way. We wish we could nudge Him, give Him a push so that He would do it in the time frame that we want Him to do it in. So what do we do? So how do we learn from this? How do we grow to live better 
in times of uncertainty. Both for this time of uncertainty we are living in now, but also for all those times of problem and worry and chaos that will continue to find us in our lives for the rest of our time here on earth. Well, today we're going to go to an expert on the subject. We're going to look at the life of the Apostle Paul, someone who lived through incredible trial, tribulation and difficulty. But someone who found a healthy, helpful and strengthening way of dealing with the times of chaos he felt. So we're going to look at the life of Paul. And we're going to do that by looking at the book of Philippians, chapter 4, from verses 4 to 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God for his word. Now the context of this well-known passage is extremely important. This letter was written by Paul to his Christian friends in in the city of Philippi. Now, this was the first Christian church established in Europe. It was Paul's baby. And he writes this letter to encourage, to teach, to keep them going. But Paul writes this letter to the Philippians from house arrest in Rome. And the story actually goes like this. Paul had been arrested in Jerusalem for preaching the gospel that was against what the rulers wanted. Paul claimed Roman citizenship, which meant he was allowed to face trial in Rome and not in Jerusalem. And so he was allowed to travel to Rome to plead his case in front of the emperor. Now along the way from Israel to Rome, their ship encounters a huge and violent storm. They were swept deep out to sea for two weeks and eventually the ship is wrecked on the island of Malta and they end up spending three months as shipwrecked people on this island. And still, after all that chaos, after all that fear, Paul is assured by God that he will get to that stage where he gets to stand before Nero and plead his case. Paul eventually arrives in Rome, and there he lives under house arrest for approximately two years, scholars guess. Under house arrest, he writes letters, he communicates to his churches, but he also draws in crowds who he teaches and shares the Gospels with. But eventually, his time in Rome ends tragically. He is beheaded on a road outside of Rome, somewhere around 61 to 66 AD. But while under those circumstances, after that shipwreck, in that time of uncertainty and fear and chaos, Paul writes these words from Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Rejoice when you are arrested. Rejoice when you are in the midst of a violent and scary storm. Rejoice when you are shipwrecked and barely make it to shore. Rejoice as you wait for something to happen, to change in your circumstances, as you spend three months on an island. Rejoice when you are put under house arrest, when you are jailed and walled up from the world that you love. Rejoice when your trial goes wrong, And you are sentenced to death. That's what Paul means when he writes these words. Rejoice always. And the key is the rejoicing in something or rather someone. 
Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. Now in Greek, uh, it is in kurio. Kurio is Lord, for Lord Jesus. But that word in has a, a sense of cause or a sense of location. So rejoice in this thing that causes you to rejoice or this place that brings up that happiness or that joy. Paul says we can always rejoice in God. The cause, the reason for rejoicing is God himself, regardless of your circumstance. Now that's a challenge to you and to me, because we can do the rejoicing thing, but we rejoice in good, happy, wonderful things. Rejoice in that promotion or pay raise. You see, we are used to rejoicing in good and lovely and wonderful things. And of course, there's nothing wrong with that. But there's a whole lot of laugh when the good, happy, joyful things don't seem to come our way. But Paul says in those times, we rejoice always in the good and the bad times. And we rejoice in the Lord. Because with God, there is always a reason for rejoicing. There is always a reason for joy, regardless of your circumstances. Hard? Yes. But Paul shows in his life that it is possible. You can rejoice in God, even in the worst of times. Even in your time of fear. Even in those hopeless moments, even when you look to your future and don't see much cause for joy. It's almost as if Paul is kind of saying, reflect always on God's goodness and mercy in your life until your emotions catch up with that reality. See, because we get stuck in the doom and the gloom and the sadness of what we are going through. But when we rejoice in the Lord, we look to God, we remember what He has done, and it somehow starts to shift our focus from the problems of now to the goodness of God in the past, the goodness of what God is still doing today, and the hope we have in the goodness of what God is still going to do. You know, this is why we sing songs of worship on Sunday mornings. This is why we pray prayers of praise and adoration and thanksgiving to God. Because we, we know that there are always reasons to be joyful in God. This is why we clap whenever we baptize a child in church. We find ways of detaching our emotions from our circumstances. Because in God, there's always reasons to celebrate, even if we don't feel all that joyful right now. Because no matter your situation or your surroundings, God is still God. And He is good. And He is powerful. And He abounds in love. And He is incredibly compassionate. And He is slow to get angry. And if you're honest, He has made a difference in your life already. And that's why we rejoice in Him. There's always a reason to rejoice in God. Paul continues in Philippians 4 by saying that we should rejoice always. And then he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. That gentleness is a, a patient forbearance with others. A, a kindness. Gentleness. Kindness. Let it be evident to all people. Now, I, I admit I have a tough time with this verse and kind of grappling with what it means. But I think what Paul is saying is don't let the times of uncertainty get the better of your character. Don't let it negatively affect the way you treat others. Don't let it change your responses to the people you live your life with. Don't let it make you treat people worse or any differently. Because isn't that what happens? When we are uncertain, when we're scared, when we're worried, we lash out, tempers flare, we get grumpy and we drag other people down, 
we're having a bad day and so we hoot at that person in front of us. We shout at the car that cuts us off. We are grumpy with the petrol attendant. Our gentleness goes out the window when we are feeling under the pressure. You know, kindness is one of the fruits of the Spirit. And often our kindness is a, 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 a marketing tool or a, a kind of overflow of the things that are going our way. You know, when we're in a good mood and things are, are great, then it's easy to be kind. But Paul says, now is when people will discover what's really inside you. Who you are, let it shine to all. Be kind, be gentle, be patient, even when times are tough. Because he continues in that verse by saying, because God is near. I think that's how Paul gets it right. He realizes that in every circumstance, God is there with him, experiencing the pain or the frustration with him, journeying with him through the ups and the celebrations, but also the downs and the lows. And because God is near and God is close, you can be gentle, you can be kind, you can live with a kindness and a compassion and a love, even when your situations are not that good. I want to ask you, how has the recent uncertainty of your life affected those around you? How has it affected the way you have responded to your family, to your friends? How has your temper flared? When have your nerves and anxieties gotten the better of you? You need to remember that the Lord is near. He is in that place with you. Perhaps we would think differently about the words we use or the actions that we perform when we are under pressure, when we are uncertain, if we could hold on to that truth. That God is always near. And then Paul gets to perhaps some of his best writing ever. In Philippians 4 verse 6, he says, Do not be anxious about anything. What he means here is, don't be troubled or distracted by the future of what might happen. You know, Paul is saying that we should channel all that negative energy, that brooding over the what might happen, what could go wrong, what the negative future might look like. We need to focus all of that energy away from the nervousness, the anxiety, the fear. We need to place that energy into praying to God. In every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Here's what we must do when we are lying awake at night. Channel those fears and worries into prayers and thanksgivings to God. When we are walking on the golf course and thinking about what we've still got to do this week, we channel that thinking into prayer and asking God for help or God for provision. When we send our kids off to school and we have that nagging in our heart, are they going to be okay? Are they going to get through this challenge? I'm worried about that thing that they're about to face. We channel that into prayer because that's how we live well with uncertainty. Paul's answer to the worry and the anxiety is to present these requests, these prayers to God. But that word present in English doesn't quite do the original Greek justice. You know, that word can also mean to, to reveal or to open up completely. It's kind of in the sense of revealing or a mystery or letting all of the light in so that we can see clearly. Paul realizes that perhaps sometimes to get to the bottom of our deepest fears and insecurities, we really need to open ourselves up and let God see the deeper underlying fears, worries, personality defects. The things that cause us to live with fear or not get over 
issues or struggle continually with the same kinds of things. Let God in. You know, when we pray, we pray with open hearts, letting God see it all. I mean, He knows what's going on anyway, but often we are quite cagey with God. And maybe that's how Paul lived so well, is he was very clear and very revealing of his heart, his feelings, his emotions with God, as he traveled through the ups and downs of ministering for Him. Reveal your heart to God. And then Paul gets to this answer, this promise from God that helped him to live so well despite all that uncertainty. In Philippians 4, we hear these words, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds. There is a peace available, a peace from God. That changes the way you deal with your circumstances. Paul still faced arrest, still went through the shipwreck, still ended up in jail and under house arrest, still ended up being sentenced to death. I'm sure Paul prayed for those things to be changed or taken away, but even when they weren't, he found a peace from God despite his circumstances. That's why Paul says it is a peace that transcends all understanding. It doesn't make sense to our human minds. We feel like we should only have peace when everything in life is fine and dandy and going well. But Paul found a peace from God. He couldn't understand it. It wasn't a human kind of peace. It was a gift from God that helped him live through his struggles and it was available and it was a gift given after Paul prayed and revealed himself to God. Paul says it guards your heart and your mind. It kind of puts a barrier around you so that you can rebuff those negative thoughts, those fearful worries about the future, that hopelessness that other people seem to get sucked into seems to just slide off you when you have that peace that comes from God. Now I want to ask you, has there ever been a time in your life when you felt that kind of peace? That peace that settled you down? That peace that made you feel like it's all going to be okay? That peace that didn't seem to match your circumstances? Things were still going wrong. The chaos was still raging all around you, but you had that peace from God. For many of us, we can recall moments like that. You know, that means that this peace is real and it still works. And if I'm honest, I didn't learn this peace from the Bible. I learned this peace from people. I have seen people go through the most horrific circumstances, yet hold on to this peace. I've, I've heard widows say, if God sees fit to take my husband from me and from this earth, then there is something God wants to journey with me through in my life without him. I've seen people handle horrific diagnoses from doctors saying, well, if this is the road that lies ahead, then there's something that God is doing in me and through me as I struggle with this disease. This peace is real. It is possible. And it is available. And the message of today is that God still has the world in His hands and that we can pray until the peace comes. And so right now, if you're not feeling all that at peace, if you're feeling like the chaos is reigning supreme, if you feel like the uncertainty is getting the better of you, I'm going to urge you to pray and present your requests to God and find ways of rejoicing even in your pain or struggle. But keep on praying. Keep on asking. Keep on going to God. Keep on praying until the peace comes.
Because when it does, it makes all the difference. You know, sometimes God answers those prayers and changes the circumstances and makes everything perfect. But even when He does it, there is a peace that will give you the strength to keep on going. And that peace can be yours because God has promised it to us. Because Paul and countless Christians after him have found that that peace that passes understanding is a gift that God can give. Would you pray until that peace comes in your life? Amen. I want to end off this time of worship by praying and praying especially for that peace to come in your life. And so let's pray. And so Lord, in a moment of quiet, we recognize that life is uncertain. And there are many things that scare us and worry us. We pray, Lord, for all those causes of uncertainty in our lives. We pray, Lord, that you would allow us to reveal our fears, our worries, our insecurities to you. And we pray, Lord, that as we present our requests to you, that you would give us your peace. I pray, Lord, especially for all those who are really struggling to find peace in this world and in their hearts right now. And I pray, Lord, that you would touch them and their hearts at this moment, that your peace would settle them down, that your presence would reassure them, that you would restore their hope, their faith, and their joy. We thank you, Lord, that this peace is real and available. We pray that you would help us to keep trusting in you and to keep praying until that peace comes our way. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you, friends, for joining us for church today. This was week two of the sermon series. He's still got the whole world in his hands. So we hope you join us next week as we close off. We're going to be talking about hope and how we need that as fuel to live in uncertain days. End off your time of worship this morning by singing along to Christ is Enough. God bless. Thank you.